I love those moments. It's it's that moment. So I heard somebody say a long time ago, plan as much as you can and then go with the flow. And I just, mm-hmm. when God just kind of arrests the environment or the atmosphere, it's it's a beautiful gift to get, you know. It's, it's beautiful mm-hmm. to get that gift from God in that moment. Between the Grooves is hosted by James Curtis, music director and morning man in the greater Toronto area on Joy Radio. Hosts James Curtis talk to artists and industry insiders to discover the connection between music and faith. You can connect with the show at faithstrongtoday.com slash between the grooves or via Twitter at between grooves. Welcome to episode 225, Between the Grooves. It's your look at music, ministry, and everything in between with today's top Christian artists. I have a very special co-host today, Aisha Woods. You are back. Well, hello. Yes, sir, I am. And I am excited about who we get a chance to talk to today. Come to find out, we are technically label mates. (laughs) You're related. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We're cousins. Cousins. Okay. (laughs) Cousins. Yeah, he's a worship pastor, he's a songwriter, and he's a painter as well. Let's introduce John Reddick. Monday morning. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Monday mornings are great. (laughs) Yes, they are. They're the best. They're absolute best. Think good thoughts. (laughs) You know what? Some some people just don't like Mondays. And I'm thinking, like, Mondays are great. I really enjoy what I do. So come Monday morning, yeah, I'm eager. I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> That's right. I hear that. I hear that. I think my Mondays are always, uh, well, Sunday is the first day of the work week, you know. For you. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and isn't Monday very often the day off? Yeah, well, we kind of, you see the Mondays or Friday. Sometimes it's Monday, sometimes it's Friday. I think we may do more Friday. Oh, okay. So we get Friday and Saturday, yeah. My brother's a pastor, and he does a lot of the preaching, So, and, and he's involved in the worship team. He plays electric guitar, so he takes the Monday off. So he gets Saturdays and Mondays off, which is really, I don't know if I could do a schedule like that. I'd, I'd rather have two days in a row, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it gets to be difficult. Yeah, I, I, I've tried both. I do think I like Friday and Saturday off better. Uh, same uh, here. Even though he's exhausted <laughs> on Monday morning. <laughs> right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, Sunday doesn't become a, a day of rest necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. So I, Aisha is on staff at a church as well. So, um, yeah, what's your day off, Aisha? Actually, I have Fridays off as well. So, okay. Uh, Friday and Saturday, I get to really enjoy and, and relax. I don't have to jump up first thing, but... Sunday morning, how they say throughout the week, Sunday's coming. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's so our true. biggest work what, day. If, wow. If, what do you do on staff at the church? I lead worship. Ah. And that can be exhausting, too. There's a lot of prep work that's involved in that. And just the, Indeed. a level of concentration and, you know, making, because are you dealing primarily with volunteers, Aisha? I am. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And John, you yeah. lead worship as well. I do. Be- I do. Between I do. paintings? <laughs> yeah, I haven't been able to do as many paintings lately as I wanted to, but it's uh, <laughs> but no, I, I I do lead worship as well. I I co-lead with a friend of mine, Chris McClarney, so oh, yeah. we get to tag team. Man, yeah, I'd love so to it's... I'd love to chat with Chris one of these days too. That, that he's a phenomenal oh, yes. guy as well. Yeah, oh, he's awesome. He's awesome. Uh, he keeps the, us laughing. The first time I ever came across your name was when Mandisa released a song. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was your song. Mm, you yes. keep hope alive, and I mean, she did a phenomenal version of it. You know, with you being featured on it as well. And and uh, since then, um, of course, you've come out with uh, the the song before we started recording. The song "God Turned It Around," and Aisha has been singing it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, oh, wow. ironic, Thank you. man. Uh, it's 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 great because someone sent me a text message just last week and they were like can i put in a request for uh songs for worship in our ser- uh, sunday mm. services and i was like yeah sure so they sent me this youtube clip and i was like oh cool i liked it i i really enjoyed it and then uh come to find out that we are having a conversation with you this morning like, okay, that was ironic, and it was it was just it perfect ironic. timing. 
Yeah. yeah. Not necessarily oh, ironic. It's it's <laughs> great timing and who knows, right? Right. You know what? Honestly, speaking of Mandisa, she likes to call it God ironic. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> thinking about how 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 nothing just happens. It's really right. God allowing things to happen and orchestrating things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How has that happened in your life? I mean, obviously you've been uh, now you you grew up in a, a musical family. I take it. Yeah, so I grew up, uh, yes, you can say that. My mom is very musical, and my dad was a pastor, and so oh, my dad you're, would you're a PK. And my mom would be. You're a PK. Okay. Yeah, 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 I'm a PK. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we have to work the hardest and learn how to be a Christian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, man. But no, I, I, it's, it's been a blessing to, um, I, actually, I'm a, I feel my dad is a pastor. My my grandfather's my great grandfather. and just everybody's wow. uh, been in the ministry, so it's uh, it's one of those things. <clears throat> and I I figured I I do music so I can just be a little bit different. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, we're all pointing to God. So you write a lot of songs, I guess. I do get to write a lot of songs. I, I love. Um, I mean, I feel like it's just a part of my life if if everybody heard it or if no one heard it i I'd, I'd be writing songs you know um just something that flows out it's kind of like art flows out in one way and music and songs flow out in a different way so it's just a way of expressing sharing with god and sharing with others and you know worshiping with others so yeah i love to get to write though how did that long that last song come about god turned it around i was yes, um, sir. actually i was <laughs> I was on the phone with my dad and we don't really talk on the phone that much. Um, probably five minutes tops. And this time, for some reason, we were we were talking for a long time. I mean, I think we spoke over an hour, which was just just wow. unheard of for both of us. But we were we were sharing um, just hard parts about our lives, um, mm-hmm. things he didn't know that it happened to me, things I didn't know that it happened to him. And it was just a moment and an endearing moment. I, I say I feel like God. Uh, God really, really met us in that moment and just even brought healing with our relationship, uh, within our relationship. And I just remember hanging up the phone and being like, God, you really do turn things around. And Mm -hmm. um, that was just a phrase that I just thought to God. And I just went to play the piano just for hours. And and I really had this desire, just this, you know, you get that burning desire where you're so excited, you want to share that with somebody else. So it just became a prayer. Like I was like, God, I whatever it is that you've just given me, this gift that you've given me, I would love for you to give it to others who are crying out for you right now um, to mm-hmm. turn things around. And so that's kind of how the song started. You know, when I when I listened to the song, John, I, I got to be honest, I, I thought it was, uh, it's such an easy song. Like a lot of times you when you hear music, whether it's a, just a CCM pop sounding song or, uh, or a worship song for that matter, um, very often it can be very complicated with the melody and the harmonies and the turnarounds yeah. and whatever else. And and God Turn It Around seems such a simple song. I I actually thought it was an old song when I first heard it. I mean, I'm not <laughs> saying that's a bad thing because it's an amazing song, but I, I just didn't know it was a new song. It's just like, oh, you know, I, I've heard this before. I must have heard this before. Oh, I guess I didn't. Right. You know? <laughs> oh, wow. I, I got to write it with a couple of friends, uh, Jess Cates and Anthony Skinner, and they're just... They're really gifted. I took it to them after that day, and um, and we just sat down and kept writing. And I, I grew up loving jazz and stuff like that, so I could make things very complicated. So I need friends of mine who know how to bring it down <laughs> <laughs> and, and simplify some things. <laughs> I know my. Are you formally trained? I know. <laughs> like where jazz uh, is concerned, are you formally trained? No, I'm not formally trained in jazz. I uh, actually I I didn't want to be. I I love it. It's, you know how some of those things you just love and. You just want to keep loving it. Um, the same with art. Like mm-hmm. I just love it. So I don't want to, if I train myself in it, then I'll just, it'll become work instead of, um, instead of enjoyment. So right, right. draw that line. I have to still enjoy some things. <laughs> I get that. Uh, can you, is there a thing as being formally trained in jazz? I thought jazz was just make it up as you go. <laughs> <Complexities. No. laughs> jazz and classical have some similarities in them they sure. they read a lot but but i think one of the things that jazz artists do is they are they may be making it up as they go 
but they're making it up from a theory, from a structure yeah, that they have yeah. in their mind. So they have these different core structures in their mind and they're just kind of letting their mind go free in different core structures and blending things together. And then some people are just just doing it. So, I mean, I think there's both in all types of music, trained and gifted. Yeah, it's amazing to see a bunch of jazz musicians getting together and just kind of playing without an agenda, just kind of making it up as they go. And yet they're all seamless. They're all in sync with each other. Um, right. that, yeah. that's always nice to see as well. And and to a certain extent, you see that a lot in worship music. I was uh, watching an online church service of my brother yesterday, and uh, at at one point, the guy that was leading worship took out his uh, in-ear monitors, and I knew that they were off course as far as, you know, what they had planned on singing next because they didn't mm. have any tracks or anything like that. And he just started mm. strumming on the guitar and it was just, you know, you hear all the musicians just just joining right in. There was no mm-hmm. thought of, oh, I wonder what key is it he's in, or I wonder what the chord structure is. Like, everybody just kind of joined in. They knew exactly what was going on, even though, and you knew that they were off track because the words didn't come up on the screen, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Those are the best times. Oh, it was, it was incredible. It was, it was really nice to see because sometimes there can be so much structure and right. and you still have structure in jazz and you still have structure in in worship but you need to have the ability to move in a different direction if uh, if that's what the holy spirit is leading towards right absolutely absolutely <laughs> Drink box, you owe me a soda. What the kids say? <laughs> but, no, I have, <laughs> absolutely, I, I, you know, I um, I love those moments. It's it's that moment. So I heard somebody say a long time ago, plan as much as you can, and then go with the flow. And I just, mm-hmm. when God just kind of arrests the environment or the atmosphere, it's it's a beautiful gift to get. You know, it's it's beautiful mm-hmm. to get that gift from God in that moment. If we could take a, a moment just to backtrack a little bit, and speaking of music growing up, if you could uh, think back on your favorite artist, non-Christian artist, who would it be? Oh, Stevie Wonder, yeah. all day long. Oh. Stevie Wonder is phenomenal. <laughs> Steve, uh, yeah, I he mean, is I, gifted. He is so gifted. <laughs> he's so gifted. You talk about writing songs. He'll write songs and make you forget that he has not seen the same things that you've seen. Yeah. If you listen back to his lyrics, he starts several lyrics out, several songs out, talking about seeing, like looking back on when I was a little bit better. Like right, songs right. like that. It's, he just uses that a lot. And I was like, man, that, and, and, I've, and if you listen to him as a 12 year old, he speaking of jazz, he's like singing and scatting with this big jazz band. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm like, man, he's just a prodigy. Yes, <laughs> and, he is. And he moves with the decades too. You know, he didn't just stay in one space. So I love that too about him. Yeah, he's he's uh, very very gifted. And like you said about the the fact that there's a disability involved, you would never know it. No. When I when I first heard his music, I didn't know he was blind. <laughs> right. And and I like yeah. it that way. You know, because I don't I don't right. like letting disabilities you know kind of form your success or non-success or whatever else like he just he's he's moved past that, which is which is great. I guess my childhood. Um, artist that I appreciated and still appreciate uh, was Michael Jackson um, oh. yeah. because because he was so uh, brilliant. I mean, you see him with his brothers and, and his family performing, but then on his own, um, he was just so gifted in writing stuff. And, and sure. a lot of the songs just sounded completely different. Like, again, with the, with the times, the beats and everything else, his his stuff has been mimicked and copied so many times. Right. Um, like, yes. I thought he was really, really good as well. For me, my my uh, my guy was Bob Marley. Coming oh, yeah. Up in, ah, me, yes. In Bermuda. <laughs> coming up in, in a Caribbean environment uh, early on. We listen to a lot of Caribbean music, a lot of soca, a lot of reggae, and a lot of calypso, oh, and and Bob wow. just kind of stuck. <laughs> so, oh wow! You grew up in Bermuda, you say? I did. Mm-hmm. Early on. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Wow! Oh uh, yeah, all of those. All Michael, Bob. I agree with that 100%. Mm-hmm. Now, if we could ever had the opportunity to get all three in a room, that would have been amazing. Oh, gosh. Uh, I know. Just to be a fly on the wall, it's... just to listen, you know? Right. Right. That. Hey, guys, let's do this. Yes. Or, hey, let's try this chord. <laughs> it's just like, oh, man, I would love to hear that. I know. 
I love how the three of them, they spoke up for things that the world needed to hear. You know what I mean? I mean, right. in, in their own right, they were entertainers, but they also, they spoke up for issues and things that the world really needed to hear. And I, I appreciate sure that. Sure enough. I was looking, actually, I was watching a Michael Jackson video last night. I think it was a Super Bowl um, halftime show uh, mm. from 93. And, and he was talking about um, how we need to step outside of our own circles and, and help those in, those kids in need who are not eating or, you know, starving. And, and Bob yeah. Marley has those same messages about speaking up for justice and things like that. Yeah, I love I love how they do that. Do you think there's a line that gets crossed though sometimes when when people are speaking about injustice or environment or whatever else uh, where that is bigger than their music? I think particularly in this time the the time that we live in now like we're in a hypersensitive culture. Oh yeah, everybody's and upset about every, something. Yeah. You know? Uh, and it shouldn't mm. be that way, but um, I think that if we take advantage of of our platforms and use them for good, I mean, God told us in His Word to speak up for those that can't speak up for themselves. So it's part of our responsibility and mandate as artists and as uh, ministers and you know speakers and those of us that have platforms. Radio show hosts. <laughs> Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that was almost. Uh, what, what was the show? What you talking about, Willis? What was that show? Right. Again? What was that show? I can't remember um, that. Oh, uh, you're talking about. Um, uh, what was that? I Emmanuel can't remember Lewis. the name. Oh, uh, yes. it'll come back to us afterwards. <laughs> but, <laughs> not Emmanuel Lewis. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say not leave Emmanuel it to Lewis, Beaver, but uh, no, it wasn't that. Um, no, not leave it to uh, Beaver. <laughs> Willis and Gary Coleman. Gary Coleman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Gary Coleman. I just can't remember the name of the show, but yeah. Mm-mm. But yeah, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, we're all we're all on these different. Um, I, I think one of the things that I've been taught well in it, or, or I, I've had great teachers who've talked about this, the story of an individual. And so, mm-hmm. when you back up all the way to the story of an individual, then you then the lines can be all over the place, you know, I mean, because depending on what the person has gone through in their lives and everybody's in this different space along, uh, along this continuum. So it's, it does depend on the story. So one person's uh, willingness to hear may not be the next person's willingness to hear. And it, and a lot of times it's because of whatever is in their story. So I think the, the, the heart of grace that we can have for each individual, no matter where they are. I, I think you're right. It shouldn't be that way. It w- unfortunately, it, it is that way. We are in this right. broken world. But I do think if we back up and have the grace for whatever it is that that person has gone through, if we do each other like that, I think our world could be a better place if we keep striving for that yeah, well, to understand it. the story. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, John. I, I think mm-hmm. the, the problem, one of the problems in our world is right now is the fact that uh, everybody's going through this this cancel culture phase, you know. And if yeah. they disagree with your message, and they get more uh, enough people alongside with them, I mean, it could destroy careers, it could destroy families, it could destroy what you believe in. Then you kind of question yourself, thinking, well, maybe maybe that's wrong. When maybe it's not. Maybe you just have morals and they don't. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> mm. And so I, I, I think people try to be over cautious now and politically correct. And, and right. I'm just thinking, like, just speak your mind. Like, we we can all get along and we can all not agree on everything, but still be sure. friends. Right. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely think we can. Uh, I think that I think being friends is where it starts, you know, sitting down, having meals with each other and hear it again to hear the story. See, if we zoom into every person who's on either side of the cancel culture, I bet you that we'll find something very interesting that each mm-hmm. individual who has an opposite story has that story for a reason, whether yeah. they disagree with it, whatever that person is saying or whether they totally agree. So I, I, you know, I, I think, yeah, hearing the stories and having the empathy for those um, really helps. 
And and the only exception to that would be the people are just jumping on the bandwagon for attention. (laughs) You see a lot of that. (laughs) Oh, it it happens. I mean, you can see it happening. It's just like, you know, how can I increase my social media exposure? Well, let me just jump on the bandwagon of somebody famous that either I agree with or disagree with. And, uh, you know, on Twitter or whatever else. And and just the, the arguments that go back and forth and. And I've said this before, you know what, social media, great to connect with old friends, even great for marketing and promoting, you know, whatever you do with your an artist or a radio guy like me. Uh, but quite frankly, I, I hope it's not people's life, you know, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's yeah. so so quickly yeah. takes over and uh, and and then you kind of lose the message because now it's all about that instead of right. You know, I don't know. Am yeah. I making sense? Yeah, yeah. No, that makes Absolutely. total sense. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I I feel you. I'm I'm like man. I hope they're praying for me. I'll pray. For, you know, even in that, I'll pray for them. Like somewhere along the line, maybe there was a lack of affirmation, and you need that affirmation. And so then my prayer becomes, how can God bring you healing? And whatever mm-hmm. was broken when you were younger, where you didn't get the attention that you need. Because uh, one of the wounds, uh, there are certain wounds that happen in childhood that actually uh, the, the, the the way they act out is the need for affirmation or the, the mm-hmm. hunger for affirmation. You know, it's just like the right. uh, a different wound leads to abandonment, you know. And so, um, you know, we all have these different things. So I just I'm. I'm in prayer as I'm in process, just like the rest of everybody yeah. else. <laughs> sure, sure. But I too hear you. It's it's not necessarily a childhood thing either. I think during the pandemic, people have kind of had to live different lifestyles than they were used to and kind of hold up at home with no communication to the outside world except through Zoom or whatever else. And now it's like right. everybody's getting outside again, maybe not even wearing a mask. And so it's like, how do you react to people? How do you socialize again, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It might not be just a childhood thing. There are traumas that happen <laughs> later on in life. You're right about that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and the stress of of um, or, or even the you know you hear the the um, things that are going through people's heads mentally uh, where they just can't handle what's gone over, gone on over the last couple of years. I know of people right. that have mm. been stuck at home for the last couple of years, uh, and and perhaps even working from home or whatever. And that was a big adjustment for them. And now for sure. going back in the office again, it's like this whole big adjustment again. I, I can't handle it. It's stressful, mm. you know? And mm, right. Yeah. Yeah. What was what was the yeah. pandemic like for you, John? Like, you know, everybody has has different stories and, and, you know, some of it good, some of it bad. I mean, obviously, there's positive elements to it. There's negative elements. What was it like for you? Um. I think one of the biggest, the, the hardest things for me is, was um, watching a lot of people uh, lose, have a loss, you know? Mm-hmm. And so yes. I think that was, that was the hardest thing is seeing so many people who had loss, whether it's people I grew up with, people who are um, in like my hometown or people in my, where I live now, people in the hospital, I just, you get to hear a lot of stories working with church and, uh, and they're heartbreaking. And so, sure. um, from, from one end to the other. So that the hardest thing for me is, was for me was watching the agony that people had to live through, you know? Mm-hmm. Aisha, did you find the same thing? Oh, absolutely. And, um, uh, actually during the pandemic, um, we lost, my former bassist and mm. I mean we've we traveled this globe together and when uh when he when he passed it was almost surreal because it was like okay like we were just not so long ago we were just traveling and mm. and hitting stages and ministering together and and now, you know, you're, you're not here anymore. Yeah. And so just like John said, you know, being at the church, you hear so much. Um, and folks come to the church for refuge and uh, where we had to shut our doors and everything was online, uh, streaming. And there were, there were challenges with that. Um, and on the, opposite end of the spectrum i think it was probably the biggest learning curve for me uh 
of my adult life, <laughs> um, having to learn how to do everything digitally mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> being in leadership, having to hold that down. I'm like YouTube tutorials, <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how to, you know, have everything together and, and prepared for our weekend experiences. And um, I definitely learned quite a bit during that time, but uh, the loss, it, it was, it was heavy, you know, but I, I also think that God used it to uh, just bring about a season of, of springtime. Like now we're, we're bursting through the seams at this point and um, we're just seeing a freshness, uh, a renewal almost. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing. And you, you kind of have to go through the valleys, you know, before you get to the mountaintop and mm -hmm. um, it's a journey, you know, and just recognizing that God, he has a purpose for everything that we go through, everything that we experience. It's, it's all working together for our good because mm -hmm. we love him and we are called according to his purpose. So um, just having to keep that in perspective and, and keep that in mind um, it, get, it definitely gets tough sometimes, but when we remember that it's all working together for our good, it, it makes it a lot easier. John, are you sensing um, anticipation with the church right now? And, and by church, I mean the church as a whole, as, as in the people of God. I, as far as being an anticipating the coming of Christ? The coming of Christ or, or a greater sense of urgency when it comes to worship. Um, just, just the, you know, it, it's almost like raising the ceiling. Like, like we, we haven't seen anything yet, you know? Yeah. I, I do think that, um, you know, we, so at our church, we haven't really since March of 2020, we've probably been online for about a month, but the rest of the time we were meeting them in, in person, uh, whether we were meeting outside, um, mm. we're just finding creative ways, you know, we're just, just trying to find creative ways to meet, but I've also been with people who have been it's been their first time like a couple of months ago so I think wow. people all across the uh, spectrum you know in various degrees do have anticipation of uh, and this desire to lean in more they've gotten to be at home um, with their families <clears throat> and whether that's been a beautiful thing for some or a, a challenging thing for others you know um, it's it's been something that's turned people closer to God, I feel like in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, because when something's snatched out from under you and when the entire globe is experiencing a trauma at the same yeah. time, you, you don't just build, you build a horizontal uh, intimacy, but you also begin to look beyond what you usually see in your day to day. So um, just leaning towards something that you know is bigger than the thing that's in front of you that can go away immediately. I think that's yeah. uh, definitely brought anticipation. So I do think the church, uh, I do think people are trying to lean closer to God and even asking themselves questions, you know, probably questions that they've never asked before, you know? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot going on in people's hearts and minds. That that would be my, uh, it's kind of what I've heard. One of the things that we've heard a lot about over the last probably year or so is this, this catchphrase deconstruction. Hmm. And a lot of there's been a lot of negative stuff to it where you hear about people saying that they've walked away from God and because they're deconstructing their faith. And then yet I've, I've heard the other side of it where it's not a bad thing. It's it's questioning. It's asking questions and there's nothing wrong with asking questions. Have you had, John, any any, um, you know, dealings, whether it be people in your church or people that, you know, uh, where they've they've used this this deconstruction term and, and what does it mean? Like, what do you see out of this? You know, I, um, when we talk about Christianity, I, th I think as humans, one thing we desire is to solve the unknown or resolve the unknown. And so when a person doesn't know what's going to happen after they leave the earth, that's, 
that's scary. Mm -hmm. So I think people have, what I've heard is people deciding to be a more, uh, a, a more authentic Christian as opposed to a person who's just choosing Christianity to resolve the conflict because our minds can't, um, can't resolve the fact that we don't know what will happen afterwards. So, you know, a lot yeah. of people say, yes, I accept this either because it got passed down to me from my parents. Um, so I'm just kind of going tradition and just kind of keeping the steps. I don't want to, you know, mess <laughs> up anything or, or, or um, I mean, who, who, I don't know how to prove anything. So I'm just going to pick, you know, I think people are leaning into saying, you know, what do I really believe? What is at the crux of my heart? What is at my core? Why do I believe it? Let me go back to the basics. Let me open back open the Bible back up and figure out what it's really saying and how I can really lean into it. I do think yeah. I've heard a lot of people trying to do that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess from my standpoint, I uh, not the not really the pessimist in me, but uh, more so the, uh, I, I, I guess, people questioning their faith and, and taking a step back for that reason, I think is admirable. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's a very healthy thing. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that uh, people, some people, shouldn't put everybody in a box, but I think some people have uh, just realized that there's more to the club. And, and by club, I mean, oh, you know, it's Christian music and, you know, it's cool to go to church and it's cool to, you know, <laughs> hang out and stuff like that. And it's, it's really like the, the, the club is over. Uh, this is a relationship. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus is real. <laughs> yeah. 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 Whew. Um, some pretty deep stuff. John, thank you so much for hanging with us. Oh, that's awesome. And thank you all for having me. This has been a great time. Yeah, it's been a lot great of fun. Yeah. Thanks a lot, John. Thanks for those questions, too. Great questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Great to meet you all. Yes, likewise. You too, bro. Take it easy. All right, you all have a good one. All right, me take too. it easy. Bye-bye. Listen, if you want to check out more about John, just visit his website. It's johnreddickmusic.com. There you will find his socials and how to kind of keep up with him and what's going on with him and his music and his ministry. That was a great conversation, wasn't it? It was. Well, it is time now for some artist advice. We welcome back previous guest, Hannah Kerr. I think if I could give any advice, I would say to make sure that you are doing everything you're doing for the glory of God. I think in any industry, in any job, it's easy to take your eyes off of the purpose and to start focusing on, oh no, how much money am I going to make? Or am I marketable? Or are people going to like me? Um, and I feel like those are the times when I've been the lowest in my career. Um, the times that I have felt the most purposeful and found the most meaning in what I'm doing is when I am making sure that everything I'm doing is all for the glory of God and fixing my eyes on Him, trusting that if I'm faithful with what He's given me, then He's going to be faithful to me as well. Um, and I'm going to learn so much more about him in the process. So I guess that would be just what I've learned along the way. Just trying to make sure that everything I'm doing is not to build my own name. It's not to be marketable or make money, but to honestly and authentically worship God. Yeah, stay focused on him. Give glory to God. It's so easy to get distracted, isn't it, Aisha? It is indeed. It kind of reminds me of a, a song that I wrote years ago. It was called What Matters Most. And it's such a great reminder to us to always do what matters most. So now we have to listen back to your song, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much to John for joining us today. Aisha, thank you so much for hanging with us as well. We got to do it this was more so often. Much fun. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot yes. of fun and we do have to do this again absolutely it was a lot of fun i'm looking forward to it and thank you for listening wherever you check out podcasts don't forget to leave us a rating a question or a comment we would love to hear from you don't forget to subscribe on your favorite app including apple podcasts spotify or iheart radio and we will let you know when new episodes drop and be sure to follow us at between grooves on facebook and twitter hey until next time 